This is a short version of a talk I gave at the CSPG CSEG annual convention in Calgary in May 2011. I believe that openness can help us build more competitive, higher performing, more sustainable organizations in this industry. I want to go over a couple of ideas, a couple of myths, two trends and two things I think we can do to help us embrace this concept. And the first idea is just that this really is nothing new. We share things all the time. And this annual convention that I was at had something like 4,000 people at it sharing a couple of hundred, probably 250 talks, 80 posters, and who knows what during coffee breaks and dinners and so on. But there are limits to the openness. And if we look at some of the abstracts, we find that there are hidden well locations or the abstracts are rather short, or they come from organizations which aren't really open and um, which perhaps in the case of Cruise, for example, you uh, have to pay to get hold of the data or the code that they're producing. The other idea is really just that there's massive value here, at least in other industries, and the recent emergence of the open source Android operating system is testament to that. There's tools like Linux and MediaWiki, of course, that are helping the open source movement capture something like 6%, according to the Sandwich Group last year, of the trillion dollar global IT market. And it's also these tools that can help small organizations like mine, for example, publish very robust tools on the internet at low cost. It's really a revolution. So there are some ideas out there that I think are erroneous. I guess we could call them myths. And one of them is that these tools aren't suitable for business, but I, I, I just say that's nonsense. People are using things like Wikipedia at work all the time for research. It's a de facto authority on all sorts of topics. And then there's massive adoption of things like openoffice.org, even in very traditional, in heavy industries, in manufacturing and so on. And it's especially being adopted, I think, in big governmental institutions where not only is cost a factor, but of course openness itself is a factor. Just as in science and just as in ethical business, openness is highly valued in, in public works. So the other myth is really around ownership and control and this idea that openness is a sort of giving up all that, that it's a free-for-all, but that's not right either. Very common open source software licenses and Creative Commons content licenses actually depend on uh, copyright. They're really just limited um, waivers on the uh, exclusive distribution rights that you have that under copyright. So copyrighted things can still be open. In fact, the only things that really aren't copyright are public domain works, like very old works of art or things produced by, in this case, in this example here, by NASA, for example. That's copyright free. So what are a couple of trends? Well, one of them is the massive growth in open tools in our business already, things like DGB Earth Sciences Open Detect, which is a fantastic 3D seismic interpretation tool. And what's really great about it is that it, it's part of a real ecosystem of uh, tools for the interpreter, like the Madagascar seismic processing tool, GMT for mapping. And you're even seeing lots of little things like Thomas Mayer Hansen's Segway Pi, for example, that might look complicated from the outside, but actually even a non-programmer like me can pick them up and write very simple programs like this one to simply read and display a Segway file. And what I'm looking forward to is a day when there's such a rich ecosystem there that I can read a paper in something like The Leading Edge and then turn to a very simple tool, perhaps a graphical interface like App Inventor, Google's um, Android development environment, and draw on a rich library, perhaps like GitHub or SourceForge, like those tools are for developers and programmers, I see a day when perhaps there's a library like that for geoscientists and scientists in general. You could say, well, those libraries exist, but right now I think they're, they're pretty distributed. They're a little esoteric and difficult to track down. One day I think they'll be catalogued and exposed for, as I say, novice programmers like myself to interact with and, and create and innovate with. 
So what can we actually do in a, especially in a closed environment? Well, you might have seen something like this before. Do you want to open a read-only copy of that file? Well, this is what control can look like. This is somebody attempting to control access to a file. The person may have left the com company in the meantime, and the main result is not control at all. It's a mess because people just save new versions of, of things and create their own repositories and so on. So what I say is open up, relax. Let go of this uh, idea that your employees are trying to rip you off somehow or screw things up and get into files and make mischief. It's just nonsense. Show them some trust. Build something like a wiki for them to co-create, to maintain documentation, maintain their ideas in public, as it were, in within the organization. And I think people really respond to this. And it's at least worth experimenting with because it costs almost nothing to grab a PC download MediaWiki, put it on there and expose it to your intranet and just let people play with it and see what happens to it. It's going to come from the grassroots, but I think it's important to remember that you know these, these notions are fairly deep behavioral changes is what we're asking people for. There has to be management buy-in. So these green guys at the top of a hierarchical organization like this fairly typical tree here, they need to be bought into this. They need to embody the notion that openness is good for the business. Now these kinds of hierarchical structures are very good at managing teams that look like this red one here, where there are clear lines of reporting and accounting uh, and managing things like vacation and things like uh, goals and so on. But they're not very good at managing ad hoc teams that might want to get together for a small three or six month project. People squabble over, well, you know, who's going to pay for them, who's going to set their goals, who they're going to report to, and so they end up not happening or being run very inefficiently. And what I say is let's find ways to experiment with building teams like this, building the right team for the right project for the, at the right time. And I don't know if this is, a, well, I'm certain it's not a purely technological solution, um, but we need to start experimenting with ways to help everyone from IT to HR to managers figure out how we're going to manage teams like this because this is what the team I think of the future is going to look like as people start working from home more or they're working from different cities or um, we want to create value kind of on the spot as it were. So I guess I don't really have a solution for this action item but I'd love to see people experimenting with ways to build this kind of team. That's all I wanted to say. Um, I, so there's a couple of ideas, a couple of myths, two trends, and two things I think we can do to build a little more openness into especially subsurface science in the oil and gas industry. So thanks very much for watching, and I hope to talk to you again sometime.